like unto the Lord Most High. No one. It's just God. So thankful for that. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Shantae, for uh, stepping in there and singing that powerfully. I do want to remind you that this evening after the p.m. service, we have a fellowship in the gym. It is also uh, the 57th anniversary of Odenton Baptist Church. It's really where I belong Sunday kind of came about, is in our celebration of the anniversary of Odenton Baptist Church for 57 years. In 1967, Odenton Baptist Church has been here in the Odenton area. Uh, Before Piney Orchard existed, it was Telegraph Road, and it stopped just past the, the building here. This portion of the facility did not exist. The small, what we call now the small chapel, that was the auditorium. It was an old Kiwanis club uh, that they began meeting in. And for 57 years, Odenton Baptist Church has been preaching the gospel, training men, discipling women to be involved with the ministry. And so this evening after the PM service, we want to invite you out, some finger foods, uh, some desserts. Uh, We've got a cake. Uh, celebrating that we belong, you belong, I belong, uh, 57 years of ministry here at Odenton Baptist Church. You know, we live in a very complicated world, don't we? Uh, Life uh, in our neck of the U.S. seems like a rat race. Maybe it's the traffic. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but it seems like we're always rushing to get places, and then we're always rushing to get home. Life seems busy, Church seems busy, work seems busy, and if we're not careful, all of the rushing will lead to pragmatic practices in order to get things done. And while that may be effective in your driving, I'm don't I'm you know don't don't ask, don't tell, right? I don't know if you how you drive. I'll leave that with you. But that might work in those areas of driving and work, but it is not an effective way. It is not an effective way for you to grow spiritually. And if we're not careful, we can replace spirituality with busyness. We can convince ourselves that we have a certain level of spirituality because of the vi- busyness of our spiritual life. Now, let me illustrate this for you. Uh, two or three years ago, when I was working on my master's in biblical counseling, I had to read a book. And I've met, when you work on, on schoolwork, you always have to read. This one was very interesting because it gave many illustrations about um, Christianity and spirituality and the things that uh, affect our lives spiritually and really keep us from being spiritual. And in this particular uh, book, they gave an illustration uh, of the common Christian family and the misunderstanding of spirituality within the home. In the account, there was a family of four. They lived in a uh, metropolitan area, and the mom ran a daycare, and the dad worked as a professor in a small college. They were all pretty busy. They felt bad that they were busy, so most of the days that they were off, they spent time doing activities. They would go to the science center, hiking, zoo, book readings, uh, just about anything that was available That's what they did so they could spend time together as a family. Because of their busyness, they ate fast food or ate out all the time uh, as a reward to the kids to show them how much they loved them. When their pastor asked them uh, to use one word to describe their family unit, the family used this word, mess. The two kids were about eight and three. They were rebellious and all over the place. The house was always a mess. Their personal relationships within the home were very weak. And after sharing their mess with the pastor, he told them that they were replacing family relationship with activity, and that activity would never build what they were looking for within the home. He counseled them to get back to basics. He said, do this. On your days off, clean the house together. Cook and eat dinner together at home regularly together, stay home on days off, and accomplish one large chore around the house. He further counseled them to have a dedicated Bible time at home together every evening when not in church. Then he told them that they needed to be disciplined to do this for an entire year with only one time a month substituting activity for a day at home. A year later, The family came back, 
and said that things had changed completely within the home. The house was clean, the kids were happy, the relationships had improved considerably. Both still worked their jobs, but simplifying their home life simplified all areas of their life. The pastor said, things changed because something changed. You went back to basics. Now, I want you to think about your spirituality, your spiritual life. Spiritually, many of us are all over the place because just like that family, we have replaced our relationship with God with activity. Activity will produce busyness, but it will never produce a strong relationship. For that, we need to get back to the basics of our spirituality. And in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, which we read, we, we find the verses, they're the theme verses of our year. And we're going to spend time memorizing them together as a church. These verses are powerful and they can help us produce a closer walk with God because the focus is on personal spirituality and our relationship with God instead of activity. And so this morning, I've got three different points for you on getting back to the basics of our relationship with God. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Let's pray together as we ask God to bless our service. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We ask now, God, that as we look at our spiritual lives, and Father, we examine the way our relationship with you looks, Father, I pray that right now, God, we would get back to the basics of what our spirituality needs to look like. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with each one here. Many are going through difficulties, trials, tribulations, struggles, but Father, I pray that through this message, you would speak to hearts. If there would be anyone here who is not born again, who has never put their faith and trust in you, that today you would open their eyes, their understanding, and that you would call them unto repentance. For believers, Father, I pray that they would get back to having a personal walk with you, and that they would get their relationship with you back on track, Father, that they would be able to glorify and honor you with a closeness. And Lord, I do pray that you would just bless now. Help us to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Back to the basics of our relationship with Christ. The first thing is in verse number six. Get back to the basis and the basics, I'm sorry, of your salvation. He says there, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. You know, salvation is freely given by God. And it is accomplished through the sacrificial work and the vicarious atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is reminding the Colossians to remember how they received Christ. You know, you didn't get saved by doing a whole bunch of works. You didn't get saved by doing some lofty, noble task. You didn't get saved because you were better than others, because you gave more than others, because you did more than others. Oh no, my brother. My sister, you are saved because you put your faith and trust in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we have received Christ perfectly. Go with me over just one uh, page, one chapter over to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verses 13 and 14. Speaking of Jesus Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When we came to Christ and we put our faith in him, we received him perfectly, meaning completely. This is where repentance comes in, turning to Christ from the old life and grabbing on to him and what he has done for us. It's perfect. What Christ has done for us. I look back on when I received the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I had gone 20 years trying to do things my way. And when the gospel light was shown in my life and I put my faith and trust in Him alone, that day on July 3rd, 1995, God saved me completely and utterly. There's nothing that I could do but believe. But yet we have taken our Christian walk, our spirituality, our life with Christ, and we have begun to convolute it to where we forget the simplicity of what salvation given to us looked like. Jesus didn't come to us and say, listen, you have to do these great trials. You have to climb that mountain peak and search the guru that's up on the top of the hill to give you the meaning of life. He said, if you will just put your faith and trust in me. And so he, we received Christ perfectly. Secondly, we received Christ freely. Look at verse 21 of Colossians 1. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled. In verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. What the Bible says is he did this freely. It is no cost to you. There are churches in the world today that have muddied salvation and turned the salvation of the gospel into another gospel by saying you have to give all of your money and sow seeds of faith in order to be saved. That's not found in the Bible. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. It's freely He said, listen, you were an enemy. You didn't even have to make restitution. You were alienated. You were cut off. And you didn't even have to come and get a passport. All you had to do was put your faith in the finished work of Christ, and he freely welcomes you into his kingdom. He seals you with his spirit that the Bible calls his free spirit. Get back to the basics of your salvation. We received Christ perfectly. We received Christ freely. We received Christ powerfully. And verse number 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now listen, it didn't cost you anything, but it cost God. His son, Jesus Christ, took on the form of a man went and lived a sinless life, perfect. He was despised by his own people. He was betrayed by his own disciple. He was beaten. He was pierced for our iniquities. He was nailed to the old rugged cross, Because he loved you. Because he wanted you to have a relationship with him. Having made peace, remember your enemies, alienated, he says in verse number 21. But Jesus made peace with you. He came and said, I will give peace you salvation. I will do all the work. He says, made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven, it was powerfully done by his perfect work. You received Christ By the full power of the Holy Spirit through the full power of the work of Christ. We got to get back to the basics of our salvation. Not only is it received freely, perfectly, powerfully, but it's 
has to be received uniquely. Look at verse number 25. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches and the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You say, Pastor, how is that unique? Because there's only one way. There's only one way, one person who can give you salvation. It's unique. It's only through Jesus Christ. We have to get back to the basics of our salvation. We have to get back to the place to where it is Jesus alone. Because what we've done in our spirituality, what we've done in our spiritual walk, is we have added so many other layers and so many other things that we forget the beauty of the Savior who went to the cross to pay for our sin. It wasn't by some amazing feat on our part, but by trusting Jesus. Why now do we think our spirituality is dependent upon some great feat that we do? No, beloved. It is simply yielding to the God that is already working in you to have His way. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6 reminds us being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that freedom of your salvation? Do you remember that day you trusted Jesus as your Savior and everything else just rolled away and it was just you and the view of your Savior? We've got to get back to that. We've got to get back to looking at Him, not, not being so, studying the Bible so critically that we miss who Jesus is. Not only do we need to get back to the basics of our salvation, we've got to get back to the basics of your walk, your spiritual walk. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6, he says at the end of that, so walk ye in him. He says this, as ye therefore received Christ Jesus, our Lord, and we just looked at that perfectly, freely, powerfully, uniquely. He says, as you've received him, you also need to walk in that same way. You need to walk in that same freedom, that same perfect work, that same uh, 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 power that God is willing to give. In Colossians 1, 10, it says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. Get back to the basics of your spiritual walk. I have five kids, five children, and I can remember when they just laid there in their crib. Then I remember when they could roll over, and that feat of rolling over was pretty impressive but then they began to crawl. But you know, they still weren't mature yet. Every time I would see them stand, I would encourage them to take a step. Come on, buddy, take a step. Why is that? Because you're going to walk a majority of your life. You're going to walk from the time that you're about a year old up until almost the point of your death or the point of your death. Your walk is very important. It's your main mode of transportation in this world. And if your children who are perfectly healthy would say, I'm just going to crawl for the entirety of my life, you would be not to please. My son Jacob and Shantae, they came up here, they sang. I'm sure glad Jacob didn't crawl up here. That would have looked kind of odd, wouldn't it have? What is the expectation? Amen. <laughs> what is the expectation? Walk. Now listen, here's where God's getting back to you. He says, listen, you are called to walk. You're called to walk worthy 
of the vocation which God has called you. Here, he says that you are called to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. One of our problems is we try to please everyone but God. Even in church. Like, oh, well, you know what? Brother Barta wants me to do some junior church thing. Man, all right, I guess I'll do it. But why are we doing it? Well, I want to please Brother Barda. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, you still should teach the class. But you should change the reason why you're doing the class. You can't use him as an excuse. Well, I'm only doing it to please him, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Well, wait a minute. We ought to say, God, you're so important to me that I will do the things that you call me to do, that you direct me to do. I'm going to walk in that walk worthy of your salvation. And then he gives us verse number seven. He, he, we get a full colon at the end of verse number six. I'm not going to go into uh, uh, English mode here, but I do want you to see that means that there's a list of things coming. This is connected. There's something more. He says, rooted and built up in him. Uh, what does that simplistic walk look like? What does that basic walk look like? It is rooted and established and built up in Christ. My spiritual walk isn't because I listened to some guy out on YouTube who dissected one verse in a particular way that he wanted to dissect it, and all of a sudden, that's what I'm going to do. No, I, I got to take the full counsel of God and be established in that. Rooted. Where are you rooted? You know, some of you are like ships out on sea and you're tossed to or fro and you have no anchor holding you in and you're just being pushed around all over with all of the different struggles of life. A wind will blow and next thing you know you're over here and you try to paddle back and the next thing you know you're blown over there and that is not what God wants. He wants you rooted in Him. So no matter what storm comes, you have confidence in who He is. Rooted in Christ. And I want you to know that's not an activity. Established in faith. Not pragmatism. You, you know, the ends justifies the mean kind of mentality. Well, you know what? If, if, I, if I just go ahead and do this, well, then people will say, wow, you're really growing spiritually. Just because somebody says you're growing spiritually doesn't mean you're growing spiritually. You have to be established in faith. Knowledge doesn't equal spirituality. I have to be established in faith. My walk should be one of faith where I trust God. I always like to bring these up and talk with people to see what they're rooted in, what they're established in, and I ask the question, if something in your life that you have looked forward to is ripped away from you, let's say the promotion that you were counting on, it's ripped away from you, what is your response? Well, most of us would be the response of, Amen, hallelujah, God have your way. Thank you for intervening and not putting me in a place that may be difficult, right? No, I can tell by the smiles out there that that's probably not our initial response. How dare you? Why is that? Because most of us aren't established in faith. I have to move on here is get back to the basics of your walk. There is a according to God's word, not according to my reason. And then abounding with thanksgiving, not with murmuring. And I don't have time to flesh all that out, but read through the text there on your own. Thirdly, we need to get back to the basics of spiritual growth. Look what he says in verse number 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Do you, do you realize that you can get so indoctrinated in philosophy and vain deceit and traditions of men and the rudiments of the world that you are no longer following after Christ in church? If your church is all about the social gospel, 
Now listen, we need to be helping folks. We need to be ministering to people. But if you're trying to bring everything uh, is, that is out in the world and here and you quit preaching Christ and spirituality by grace through faith and believing what the Bible dictates and declares, well, and you start getting off in other things because that's what's popular in your culture, you need to get back to the basics of spiritual growth because that won't make you spiritual. Matter of fact, they're contrary to the work of Christ and will provoke busyness and not spirituality. And along with that, we need to get back to the basics of who God is. In verse number 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead boldly, or bodily. What does that mean? Creator God. In Romans 1.20, eternal. In Romans 1.20, supreme. In Romans 1.20, holy. In Psalm 99.9, Savior in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, we have to get back to the basics of who God is. I want to recommend a message to you by a gentleman by the name of S.M. Lockridge. He preached a famous sermon entitled, That's My King, Do You Know Him? And in this particular message, there's a section where he begins to elaborate on who God is. I'm going to read an excerpt from, this, from his message to you because I can't improve on what he did. He says, the Bible says my king is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define him, his li- can, can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, Entirely, eternally steadfast, immortally graceful, empirically powerful, and impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizons of this world. He's God's Son. He's a sinner's Savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of Himself. He is awesome. He is unique. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of every good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be the all-sufficient Savior. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the uh, the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He, He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteousness. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. And then he says, I wish I could describe him to you. That's our God. We make our spirituality about what we do instead of about who he is. And as we get into 2024 with our theme of back to basics, simplifying our spiritual life, 
I want to call you to get back to that point where you entered into the fellowship with Jesus Christ and you were okay with not knowing every little thing because he was right there with you, walking you through it all. His hand was holding yours. You weren't leading him. He was leading you. You weren't saying, God, show me this. He was saying, let me show you something powerful, son. Just imagine if we would get back to the simplistic walk of our spiritual life with God. The difference that could make as we enter into this next phase of 2024, just holding on to Him and trusting Him as we walk in the basics of our spirituality. Let me have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Who might say this this morning? Pastor John, I've never trusted in Jesus as my Savior. I've never believed in Him. I have not asked Him to come into my life and save me. I am struggling with life, and I need God. If that's you, would you just simply put your hand up? I want to pray for you. Pastor John, I need God. God, I need that simplistic salvation that he is offering to me. If you're here and you haven't received that, now is an opportunity that God has given to you. Pastor Lacombe, Pastor John, will you pray for me? I need that salvation. If that's you, just put your hand up. I'm going to pray for you. Go ahead and just put it right up and put it right back down. I'm just going to pray for you. Who would say this? Pastor Lacombe. I hear this portion of Scripture, and I'm going to be honest, I I need that to get back to the basics. I've been struggling in areas of my spirituality. I've I've, I've made it messy. I've made it convoluted. I've, I've, I've done all sorts of stuff, but I don't feel any closer to God. Pastor, I need to get back to the basics of my spiritual life. If that's you, would you put your hand up? I want to pray for you. You were talking about me. I need to get back to the basics. Please pray for me. Many hands going up. Anyone else, you can put your hands down. Anyone else, Pastor John, pray for me. That's me. I need to get back to the basics of my spirituality. Please pray for me. Amen. I see your hands, your hands as well. Anyone else? Amen. I see your hands over on the side. Anyone else? And then who would say, Pastor, I want to have that simple walk where I feel God's presence and I let him lead and guide me and I just trust him as he leads me. i am be honest, I've kind of flipped it a little bit. I keep running and expecting God to follow me. Would you pray for me that I would just submit my life to God and get back to the basics? If that's you, you put your hand up. I want to pray for you. Amen. I see your hands on the side. I see your hands in the back. I see your hands all over the auditorium. Father, I come before you and I just pray now, God, that you would be with this invitation. Father, as a church, that we would just get back to the basics and let you lead and guide. Father, that your people would be invested into your church, but Lord, we wouldn't be doing things just for the sake of being busy. Bring us back into that simplistic Christian life that we can honor and glorify you. I pray for anyone here that's unsaved, Lord. I pray that you will not let them leave this morning without trusting in you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, please just stand to your feet. The piano is going to play. Many questions were asked and many hands were